Our next presenter um, is um, <clears throat> Christopher Young, Professor of History, also from the Department of History, Philosophy, Political Science, and Religious Studies. Um, and uh, he will be speaking to us on the topic of the life of Benjamin Pettit as a hero's journey, 1811 to 1839. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Good morning. So this is a love story. Benjamin Petit, he left his home. He left his brother and widowed mother. He left his profession as a lawyer. He left his country. He braved the Atlantic Ocean and entered the interior of the American frontier. By himself, he went among a people that he didn't understand their culture, he didn't understand their language, and he felt deeply loved. As part of this love story, I will introduce you to the hero's journey to those who are not familiar with the narrative framework. I will encourage you to think of each of your, your own hero's journey, because surely each of us are on, our, on one. And teach us something a little bit about Benjamin Petit, who served the Potawatomi during the late 1830s, not far from where we are today. So while we don't have time to discuss all the stages of the hero's journey, I want to encourage you to think about your own hero's journey. You know, when did you cross the threshold from the known to the unknown? Uh, when did you face tests, allies, and when did you encounter an ordeal and then return from that experience with wisdom that you're able to share with others because you took that journey? So while I can't go through all that, there's actually 12 stages to the hero's journey. I'm going to cover three of them. And those are the, uh, the, uh, the call to adventure, the ordeal, and the return with the elixir. Call to adventure. Petit was born in 1811 in France. He was an excellent student. He went on to law school. After law school, he developed a reputation as a public speaker. And amid this, this, his budding success, this comfortable life in France as an attorney, he began to you know he just wasn't that satisfied. So the young man entered the seminary. And the 26-year-old Petit, uh, not long after entering the seminary, heard the bishop from Vincennes, Indiana, uh, who came there to say that they needed missionary priests in uh, in the United States, and so he was he got really excited about this. He was hooked, and so he enthusiastically went to the bishop, said, "I want to join you in the American force, and I want to serve uh, where I can." Petit had received his call to adventure. Petit crossed the Atlantic Ocean with the bishop and the seminarians, and he arrived in New York City in 1837. He made his way down the Ohio and eventually arrived in Vincennes. Not long afterwards, the newly minted, ordained Father Petit was dispatched to northern Indiana to serve the Potawatomi, who were devoutly Catholic, and they, they were in the area that was near where University of Notre Dame sits today. By the 1830s, the United States government had established a series of treaties with the Potawatomi that would lead to the eventual removal of the tribe, or most of the tribe, from Indiana uh, at some point. But one particular treaty that we're particularly interested in was it called for the Potawatomi to re be removed from Indiana by the summer of 1838, which would be one year after Petit arrived with the tribe. When Petit left Vincennes for South Bend on horseback, he was leaving the known world for the unknown world, the ordinary world for the special world. And he embraced this experience because he thought it was a gift from God. Whether it was moving from village to village, through the snow, on a sleigh, you know, through the woods, toppling over a number of times along the way, or interacting with the Potawatomi. He just loved it. He was so damn happy, Serena. He loved everything about it. Paper would not suffice to convey the feelings of my heart, he gushed. He was also energized. If I discovered some Indians walking along my path, all my fatigue is forgotten. And when their smiles greet me, I am refreshed as if my own family were welcoming me. He came to eschew the comforts that he had known in France. In fact, when he was in his cabin walking through it, the loose floorboards reminded him of piano keys. He began to sleep on the floor with just a blanket. And he wrote to his mom saying that he even felt healthier with this lifestyle. 
Most of all, he fell deeply in love with the Padua. He laughed with them. He mourned with them. And he learned their language. He learned their language, uh, and he was finally able to hear confessions uh, with the Potawatomi to give homilies. And when this happened, he said that he and the Potawatomi looked at each other, equally stunned that he was speaking Indian. He considered it a high compliment when a Potawatomi woman came to him and said, you are no longer a Frenchman, you are Indian. And he thought this was like the best thing. When the time approached for the removal of the Potawatomi from Indiana during the late summer of 1838, Petit did all that he could do for them. He even used his skills as an attorney to advise them without crossing over the line to violate federal policy. The ordeal for Father Petit had begun. When the soldiers came and surrounded the chapel, they wept together during their last mass, not only in the village, but together since the bishop forbid Petit to go with the Potawatomi to Kansas. I assembled all my children to speak to them for the last time. I wept, and my children sobbed aloud. While ill with fever, he said his goodbyes. Eventually, word reached the bishop and then Petit that the federal agents requested his presence. Despite feeling ill, he hurriedly joined the Potawatomi, who were at this point near Danville, Illinois. He ministered to them for two months on what has become known as the Trail of Death. Over 800 members of the Potawatomi tribe were removed at this time. It had caused a, a queue that, that stretched three miles long. Along the way to their new home in Kansas, 39 people died. Along the way, Petit advocated rest on Sundays. He ministered to the sick, and he comforted the dying. As they approached Kansas, Petit's fever returned, and he began to be covered with sores. Once he saw his beloved Potawatomi settling in with the Jesuits in Kansas, he began his return to Indiana. Petit said he was grateful that the good Lord permitted me to make this journey, despite the open sores on his posterior, his thigh, all the way down his leg. After 150 miles, he stopped at St. Louis University and could go no farther. And there he died on February 10, 1839, in the care of the Jesuits. And his body was laid to rest by priests, scholars, students, and a great number of Catholics on horseback and in carriages. His was the last death on the Trail of Death. The Return of the Elixir. Despite dying on his return, the young Father Petit brought back to the known or ordinary world an example of how love is a force in history, despite the hate that threatens to overwhelm. St. Thomas Aquinas defined love as willing the good of the other, Petit willed the good of the Potawatomi. He loved them. Love was at the center of his service to them, and this was a choice. And as Epictetus reminds us, if your choices are beautiful, so too will you be. From his call to adventure to serve in a distant, worst land, through the ordeal of the trail of death, to his return with the elixir, Petit always, when given a choice, willed the good of the other. And with that, he returned from the special world to the ordinary world, from the unknown to the known with the elixir. Love is the key to a beautiful life. Father Petit, he lived 27 years, 10 months, 2 days. A short life and a beautiful life. Thank you.